Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Federal Postal Judge David Hyphenwin Fulcolin Miller. I punctuate my name because it makes me into a fact. We have made this three hour presentation as a housekeeping video to show what the Federal Postal Court is all about, the clerk of the court, and the claimant, and how much work goes into putting together a lawsuit to be filed at the Bureau of Conveyance here in the Hawaiian Islands. We are the only country, we are the only state of the 50 states that uses a Bureau of Conveyance. On the mainland, you will be using just the clerk of the courts filing your documents so the Bureau of Conveyance issues will not be uh, an issue at this point. The rest of this document is going to be about our postal, banking, and grammar, and why we as federal postal judges have jurisdiction and how this came about, and the history of the Hawaiian Islands, as well as the history of how the federal postal judge judgeships and federal postal court came about so that the people of the world know that the federal postal court is not an affiliation with the United States of America, the United States of America Corporation, or any other country. We are a organization that deals with the unity states of our world corporation is our official title. And what that means is we are not a citizen of a country. We are, a, we are two judges, Russell J. Gould and David Wynn Miller, that are changing the, or correcting the grammar into a mathematical interface to show the people the tricks and the traps and the secrets of the courts and how documentations must be created, how constitutions have to be written, how trusts have to be written, to have a better understanding or a better claim on the contracts that you write. Thank you. I am Federal Postal Judge David Hyphenwin Focol and Miller. Beside me, I have Federal Postal Judge Russell Hyphen J Focol and Gould. We use punctuation in our names because it makes us a fact, not a adjective pronoun fiction. You can go to the dwmlc.com website and also. Uh, see 400 pages of technical information that backs this technology over the past 14 years. We are making this video for the public because this is a federal postal court. The federal postal court was established on 12-21-2012. For I concur. Now we went back to give you a little history. We uh, had been, we were both federal judges, and we had been corresponding with the United States District Court and with the United States Department of Justice, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the uh, United States Tort Division in Washington, and with the Senate Oversight Committee. As a result of those actions, a uh, we had filed a claim at the United States Department of Federal Claims. And as a result of that, we got a letter back as an invitation to come to Washington, D.C. Well, that invitation was actually a coded letter that said, if you come to Washington, D.C., you will be arrested. On the back of that Washington, D.C. letter was a stamp by Benjamin from original July 4th, 1775, seal of the Federal Postal Court. So we did, we started doing some research. And the research took us to the England Oversight Committee, which then made Benjamin Fra Franklin in, in 1772 the first federal postmaster of both Canada and the United States. That's before the United States was created. Three years later, 
On July 4, 1775, Benjamin Franklin opened the Federal Postal Court, at which time the Revolutionary, Revolutionary War kicked off and war vacates contracts, so the Federal Postal Court closed. As a result of the chain of events that took place next, the United States uh, had to borrow money, 1.6 million francs from the French in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which was the capital of, of America at this point in history. They went ahead and they, the war took place from 1775 for seven years until 1782. 1782, the United States couldn't pay back the French the two million francs that they had borrowed and filed domestic bankruptcy in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That went on for an additional seven years until uh, September 17th, 1789. In 1789, the Constitution of the United States of America was drafted, which was a bankruptcy trust putting the United States of America into a 70-year international bankruptcy for $3 million. Now, the, the dollars were in the form of the, the uh, Bank of England had lent, had picked up the note through the Rothschild family. So that then turned the United States into a international bankruptcy corporation. The Constitution of the United States of America was written in an adverb, verb, adverb, adjective, pronoun, pronoun, adverb, verb, style of grammar. This is called parse. And the parse is what parts of words are like the word international. I-N means no, T-E-R is terra, nation is people, A-L is contract. So our, the English language made parse words and then it, excuse the expression, bastardized them. Benjamin Franklin writes the Declaration of Independence. The is an adverb modifying declaration, D-E is no, Claire is speak, at is contract, I-O-N is contract. Of is an adverb, now making uh, independence. In is no, D is no, pen is right, ants is contract. So he said you will not write contract and you will not read contract. And then he wrote we the people. We was a pronoun. The is an adverb, making people a verb. So he went ahead and he made the, the people of America into fictions. You can either be a pronoun nothing, which is a dead entity called nom de guerre or sodium, or you could be a verb, which was a condition of an illusion fiction. So the government then went ahead because Benjamin Franklin was a French attorney working for the English crown as a secret agent to capture the United States of America. And when he wrote the United States of America, the is an adverb making united to be an adjective of the pronoun states. The word of is an adverb connecting to the pronoun in front of it and I'm modifying the dangling participle verb America. Now the parse of America, A means no, M-A-R-I is Latin for mercy and C-A is Latin for sheep. Now how do you get to be America to be a verb? Well, Modif an adverb modifies. Modification is change. Change is motion. Motion is action. And action is verb. So what we had now is a, uh, an, an ad adverb verb modification to create a fiction. All 50 states of the United States are written state of, and then they give them the name of the state, or state of a compound like North Dakota, South Dakota, North Carolina, South Carolina. And in 1834, Congress passed a law that our compound nouns must be hyphenated, which would have then turned North Dakota, South Dakota, North Carolina, South Carolina into verbs with a hyphen in the name. So they wanted to make sure that all 50 states had were con a condition of verb to go with we the people as a verb, to fit into the America verb. And this is a history of fiction from, from 1775 until current day. So we went ahead and in 1988, April 6, 1988, I broke, broke the mathematical interface on grammar. And I proved that all grammar, 
all languages are a mathematical equation of algebra. And with that, I was able to rewrite the way grammar is used and create the website and the technology that is now published all over the world with over 5 billion people studying it. The function of a federal postal court was when we saw the seal and did our research on this, we went back to July 4th, 1775. And we filed our documents. We filed our oath of office. And we filed our charter. We went ahead and we ordered open the federal postal court July 4th, 1775, under a Title 42, 1986, for knowledge of a fraud and the authorization to stop and correct it. We also filed a claim for the fraudulent conveyance of language against the English Oversight Committee that appointed Benjamin Franklin in the first place and vacated his position to be what he was because of the fraudulent conveyance of language. For I concur. Now, fraud is like perjury. I don't care what language you speak. I don't care what country you come from. All people on this planet know what perjury is. It means you have knowledge of a fact, but you tell a lie to twist it. Now, the conversation I'm having with you right now on this video is also being said in an adverb-verb condition of thinking. For I concur. The reason for that is, in order for a teacher to communicate with a student in a language that they understand, we go ahead and we still communicate with you in your adverb verb language. However, when we write our documents, which you can read, they are all written with the correct mathematical procedure, both on the websites and all the documents that have been filed. Now, the documents that I have in front of me on this table are also on the DWMLC website, and they are up there for the people to read. They are also there to see this entire presentation in a written format so that you can understand what it looks like in a writing format. Because when you read quantum language, it will give you a headache. Why? Because you've been brainwashed to only see an adverb verb or adverb adjective and pronoun condition of state. When you start reading prepositional phrases, it will then change the ability of your mind to comprehend things so that you will see both frontwards and backwards that grammar is correct when it's done in a mathematical program. No one has ever gone to war or a math problem in the history of mankind, but they've been killing each other over the adverb-verb communication skills of both the religions, the faiths, the political contracts that are written between governments, the political thinking of how governments function, and all the treaties that they write between each other. Now, we're out here today in Maui, Hawaii, and as the history of Hawaii was, has been published, and, but the history that you see in the books all over the world are not what actually took place out here. A unique thing was, in, in 1789, a man, the Captain Cook, shows up out here, and he discovers what's called the Sandwich Islands. Well. For him to discover something, DIS means no of covery. He makes no covery of the Hawaiian Islands. That's called parse. His non-covery takes him back to England. And then they, other people show up out here around 1800, first to bring out bishops and, re, and religious organizations to go ahead and give people faith, and teach them the Bible, teach them how to read and write in an adverb-verb scenario. And then new laws are created in an adverb-verb scenario. They be believe if an adverb-verb scenario is, is good enough for God, it's good enough for people and how to manage the people. But the Hawaiian people in their, re in their own native language resisted being modified. There's a secret that Russell and I personally discovered, and we worked at for 8,000 hours that every word that starts with a vowel, A, E, I, O, and U, and is followed by two consonants, it means no contract. And if you have a word that starts with a vowel and is used as a single syllable, the word also means no contract. The unique thing about the Hawaiian languages, 
There are no words like that. And the English grammar that was taught out here, they, they wound up killing 38,000 people because they refused to use an adverb verb scenario of language. When the people were terrified enough, they then went ahead and capitulated to using an adverb verb style of language. In 1848, King Kamehameha I first made a, a proclamation that if you are dead or off the land for 20 years, the land would be free for settlement. Well, in 1789, when Cook showed up, there were two million Hawaiians living in the Hawaiian Islands. But because the white man brought a dozen different diseases out here, pneumonia, smallpox, chickenpox, tuberculosis, herpes, a lot of other nasty diseases, mumps, measles, it reduced the population by 99%. In, a in 1829, there was only 34,000 Hawaiians alive, still of a pure bloodline. So the Philippines, Japanese, Chinese, Americans, Portuguese, all came out here. The whaling was good, and the island was overrun by other, all different ethnic groups. So because the population was so low, this proclamation was made that if you were dead or off the land, that you would wind up being free for settlement, the land would be free for settlement. Now a man by the name of uh, Bailey came out here in 1828. He was a surveyor, along with some judges and attorneys, and a marshal. And they went ahead and they cut up this land out here in Maui into 172,000 uh, different sections. And Bailey wrote his name on a lot of the choice parcels of land. But he didn't have title to the land. He wasn't given title to the land. But then nobody went back. And over time, it became a, an issue of who owns what just because of these plats that were put out. And people are buying and selling land here in the Hawaiian Islands, but there's no titles in the Hawaiian Islands to anybody. When the kings and the queens wrote their, their uh, land, land grants, the land grants that they wrote were under the laws of alien, A-I-L-I-N-G. It means that you kill another person and you take their land or conquer their land. And because of this alien terminology of conquerage, it vacates that every single land, all of the lands out here in the Hawaiian Islands have no titles or clear titles. So by bringing out the Federal Postal Court and establishing that here in the Hawaiian Islands and in the United States and in Canada, we are bringing to the attention of the world that federal, that the, the post office was established in 1871 worldwide, where all of the countries of the world for a two cent postage stamp signed up to be, to have mail delivered for two cents. Seems like a really great deal. Except mail is also a condition of cargo, of value, of money. And so the post office for a two cent postage stamp under one year maritime law of salvage under Title 46, Chapter 781, laid claim to all the countries of the world. And then a year later, jacked the price of the postage. After they had everyone traversing with them to give them jurisdiction that the post office was in charge. People have been talking about the New World Order. The New World Order has been here since 1871 called the post office. It was just one small detail that everybody overlooked. They never had the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Man has never violated the, the rules and operations of math. But when he went ahead and they took what is an adverb, what is a verb, what is an adjective, what is a pronoun, what is a position, what is a lodial or article, what is a fact, what is past time, future time, and the conjunction, and they bastardized it and misrepresented the values of the parts of speech 
They went ahead and created a world that goes back 8,500 years of adverb, verb, fiction, communications, violating how words come together, violating how words are formulated, violating the condition of mathematics. Therefore, in 1988, when we reestablished the mathematical interface and grammar, we were able to go back 8,500 years and correct the grammar. It's a big task. This technology disqualifies or vacates every treaty, trust, and contract ever signed on this planet in the history of mankind. For I concur. So what we, we've been doing, Russell and I, for the, since 1995 publicly, is we've been putting on seminars, writing documents, treaties, trusts, contracts, and we have been supplying the world for free how to rewrite documents and putting those and publishing those on the internet as well as going to the United Nations and making treaties with 82 of the 200 countries. And, and, the, and the Pentagon. And the Pentagon. Yes. And on the 12th of August, 1999, Russell and I received sovereignty country status because the condition we applied to the United Nations to be an independent country because the condition of quantum language in a world of 8 million fiction people's communication skills was so unique that the 200 members of the United Nations voted to have us have our own country. We had a bank charter. We had a constitution all written in quantum language. We had a bank with gold. We had our, all of our treaties in place with the United States of America, Department of Justice, we sued the United States for the flag of the United States under Title IV, Section 1, 2, and 3. Now, we did that on the 25th of July, 1999. And when we did that, we challenged the United States Congress, Senate, Legislature, and Supreme Court to bring forth their correct parse syntax grammar, sentence structure, copyrights of the flag of America. They couldn't do it. They couldn't even produce an oath of office that was written in the correct parse syntax grammar. And on the 12th of August, 1999, the United Nations voted that both Russell and I were independent, sovereign individuals with a flag. We've captured the flag with the correct parse syntax grammar. We had our own bank. We had our own constitution. We had our own trust. We had treaties with other countries. We also uh, did some very unique things uh, dealing with uh, registering it and setting up our own Global Hyphen Bureau of the Weights and Measures, which had lab, uh, uh, allowed us to establish our post roads. Post roads occur because the land was captured through the postal treaties that we had written a now time scenario for. Upon that, everybody has their ship's papers as they navigate themselves from point A to point B. But because how the world was moving to in their frantic state of war, we took it to other steps to register the program uh, through organizations such as NATO. Um, David and I are both joint muster hyphen masters uh, through the Secretary of the Navy's office through the Pentagon, which we filed for prize master, prize commissioner for the capture and salvage of the Title IV 101.9 dimension flag. The technology has allowed us to sit in a world of fiction and claim our position of sovereignty through the establishment of correct protocols, taking things from a quanta, which is the, the overall picture we're showing you, to a least common denominator of a quantum, which is claiming everything from the magnetic flux that you see to the, the elements. We have our own periodic tables for our own measurements of, of melting points, of taking matter from, from, from solid to water to, or to to gas, so we, we've articulated and given closure to the world in the banking system and in the military paradigm that is around us to the certification of correctness. Then the next thing that kind of puts the cheese and makes this all binding is the United Nations says, what country do you claim? What is your land mass that you claim? as the other 200 countries here have already claimed up all the land on planet Earth. He says, we claim the land of the courtroom floor during the time of correct parse syntax grammar contract. What is a vessel? Paper is a vessel in a sea of space. What is a court? 
A court is a closed area. It contains a constitution. We have a stamp, and the stamp is a $1 stamp, is a whole number. Russell and I sign our, autograph our name across the stamp, making us postmasters to transport the vessel of the contract during the time of, of contest. We then endorse the top of the back of the document the same way you endorse the back of your checks when you're at the bank to give them equity. We also fingerprint, which is our notary. And then we go ahead and we put our, our autograph on the last page of the document to take jurisdiction for everything in front of it and above it, and we place our seals on the document with a crunch. It's a crunch seal which deforms the paper. And then we add our evidence, our forensic evidence that we are stopping and correcting. And what we do is we use number, we use a numbering system on the, on the document when we're correcting paper. Because to write the word adjective above the word red, there wouldn't be enough, enough space above the words to put all the, what is a adverb, what is a verb, what is an adjective, what is a pronoun. So we use one for an adverb, two for a verb, three for adjective, and four for pronoun. And we put that on the document. Now this causes an individual, once they realize this and understand the technology, they can read 300 words a second and understand what is on a document, how fraudulently it was conveyed. You know, most people say they read 100, 100, 125 words a minute because the words are creating pictures in their mind and they're trying to comprehend things. When we reduce this into a number code, an individual learns how to read the number codes. You can take documents like this here and two seconds identify the fact that they're a lie, that they're a fraud, that they've been modified. Now going back to 1999, after we, became, after we got our country established, we went ahead and we started publishing and putting up a website. And Russell and I worked on this about 100 hours a week each. We're still doing it today. It's been 14 years of, of uh, labor of love putting this together so the world has a path yeah. by which to follow a quantum, a new quantum procedure. Now we have there is estimated to be three billion websites on the internet and there are no competi there is no competition for the quantumized website that we placed up there because I have 80,000 hours of background and Russell's got about 45,000 hours of background in this program. We also have other individuals that have donated, have put in 20, 25, 30, and 40,000 hours of research and they bring their technology to the tables. As you know, there are many facets to the world of communications. And so these are, are delegated out to these individuals so that they can study, use what we've already taught them, and then enhance on that and bring any new information back to the table that they may understand to, to better solidify the technology. The United States Codes has over four billion laws that are written. We have only a few that we use. We have over 150 different laws that articulate false and misleading statements, fictitious conveyance of language. Mail fraud. Mail fraud and deprivation of rights under coloring of the law. Now when you put in perjury, when you take those five things and they open up to 150 other charges, you're talking about $100 million worth of fines, 1,200 years in prison. Well, that's kind of overkill to point at any individual saying, we're going to go ahead and charge you with all this, these, these damages. When we go ahead and we take a piece of paper like this, and we syntax, putting numbers on it, this becomes the physical evidence. This isn't where we have to go out and, and look for, you have a sore back. What is the opinion of how much damage is done to your car? Or how much opinion damage is done? This is physical mathematics on just the words on paper. And when you take words on paper and you bastardize them, and you create fraudulent conveyance of language and fictitious conveyance of grammar, it goes ahead and it gives us the physical evidence to go ahead and write a lawsuit 
and use and bond this to the document. Now, there's three, three forms of bombing. You can either stitch it. Now, the, if you go into the old archives of the United States for, for documentations, they used to stitch the documents together. Later, they, when sometimes they used rivets, brass rivets, and rivet paper together. A staple does not bond a document together. It's called maritime law of stapling because staples can be removed. But to permanently put the documents together, we use glue. And so we glue the documents together. When you glue documents together, you now have a bonded document. When you have a bonded document, you become an author. So when you testify about what it is you have bonded, you are now an authority. Now, when somebody says we have an expert witness, the word EXP, a vowel and two consonants, means you are a no contract individual and you're only going to render an opinion. So don't call yourself an expert. You're either a correct authority is the correct terminology to use. Now, when we went ahead and we ordered open the Benjamin Franklin Federal Postal Court, we now had to go ahead and create a whole new set of documents. We went to the United States Supreme Court, Department of Justice, President of the United States, and we served them, these are the green card, return receipt, certified and, and registered mail, to uh, show them that the Federal Postal Court on 12-21-2012 was now open. We waited one year and filed a title, and also filed a Title 46, Chapter 781 salvage claim on Benjamin Franklin's Federal Postal Court, which went into effect on 12-21-2013. No law becomes legal for 45 days under maritime law of trust and a three-day rescission. We have completed those also. In effect of February 5th, 2014, we are now a 100% legal, authorized body of two judges, which is corporation, to hold court as a federal postal court and take and put the grammar on trial. And that's all we do. We only try the grammar. We do not use subject matter. You can't bring a car accident to us. You can't bring us medical documents or not, excuse me, medical saying that you've got a sore back. You can't bring a rape case to us or a bank robbery case to us or a murder case to us. But you can bring a contract case to us. Now, if you were damaged in a car accident, let's say, we can't prove the subject, the subject matter of a car accident or how much physical pain you have. But the one thing you do have is you have a piece of paper. And that piece of paper is an insurance policy. If the insurance policy is written in adverb verb and says nothing and the insurance company refuses to pay, then we are in a position to go ahead and syntax that insurance company and write a lawsuit. If you go out and you buy yourself a home, now it's, it's been advertised throughout the history of, of the world to, to be a homeowner, not a renter, but a homeowner, to be part of a community. But when the individual goes ahead and they write a contract, and this is a, the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac contract that is used about 64 million times in the United States. That's about $47 trillion worth of mortgages. Uh, they went ahead, and for the camera's sake, and we'll, you'll be able to see this better, we went ahead and we color-coded this document. Now, when we color-coded this document, just to show you how easy it is, you can't see the words from where you are or from where the camera's at. But we went ahead and we made the adverb into a, a pink or pink color, and we made the verb into a green and an adjective pronoun. What is an adjective pronoun? Let's say the word red pen. Red is a fact. Pen is a fact. When you put one fact in front of another fact, the first fact modifies the second fact, and the first fact is prejudicial. Is it red? Is it crimson? Is it blood color of a pen? You see, so you're, there's 1,200 shades of red. So which shade are you, are you referring to when you identify the word pen? Because color is an opinion, explain red to a blind person who's never seen before. So what we've done here is we've taken 
and color-coded the words on the paper so it's easy for an individual to see. We have, as you can see, an adverb is a modifier, and all the verbs on this page are actual facts that are being used as a verb. It's called a gerund noun. How do you spell noun? N-O, no, U-N, no. It's a no-no. So then they go ahead, and as I flip through the pages here, you can see the pink and the green. These are how many times they're modifying a sentence. You know, you're only, only allowed one verb in a sentence, and on this page I've got, I've got one, two, three, four, five sentences. So it means I should have five verbs, verbs, but I have over 100 verbs, which are nouns used as a verb, and I also have 100 modifications. Well, the modifying, if you modify something, you change it. Well, anytime you modify something, that's perjury, because you're not dealing with the facts. So now you have a fraudulent conveyance of language here in forensic evidence. As I turn to pages, you can see how, many, how much coloring is on these documents. And you can see that in everything that is in white, that's an adjective pronoun. So there are no prepositional phrases to certify the value of a word. And we've certified that each word has 900 different definitions through mathematics. On these pages, we just identified the adverbs just to show you how much modification. And then on the back of the document, on all these mortgages, deeds of trust, grant deeds, all over the United States, the bank does not sign your mortgage. Only you do. When you have a contract to buy something, it takes two parties. When you have a title, like title to a car, you have a seller and a buyer, and both people's sign the contract. So are your contracts legal? Look to see that both parties took responsibility to sign them. If they haven't, somebody's cheated. You don't have a contract. You may have a piece of paper, and if a piece of paper is held together by staples, it's not a bonded document. When we bond a document, we glue it together, and therefore it has uh, value. Next thing I was going to talk about is the mechanics of how our federal court functions. The federal postal court was put together because the documents that you bring to us, that you want us to participate with, we will school you, spend time with you, if you have a grievance. We will show you that your grievance must be restricted to only using the correct parse syntax grammar. You cannot make presumptions about what somebody did to you. An individual can only talk about themselves because only you and what is in your mind and what is in your feelings is first-hand information. You can't say that somebody else has damaged you. You can only say you were damaged by that individual because the word by is an assignment of authority. In other words, for the claimant's knowledge of a fact is with the claim of the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, with the laws, rules, regulations, and codes, with the contract by the author. So an individual, or by the claimant, or by the judge, or by the attorney, you see, so you're bringing things down into a prepositional, an order of prepositional phrases, you're first establishing the fact that you have knowledge. Okay, what is, what is knowledge? Knowledge is a cause. As you look around you, you see objects. You see facts. And your brain stores those. That's called a consequence. Just like when we feed information into a computer for later recovery. In order to recover anything from a consequence of the stored knowledge inside you, you have to do thinking. You have is is singular and are is plural, and those are the only two verbs in the entire English language. Once you establish the motion of firsthand information that is in your brain, you then go to a possessive, and that preposition is called with, with the claim. And then the next, and after you have a with the claim, you're going to have a cause. And that cause is going to be defining the terms so what, what are the claims? You're going to, you're going to find a, the, the, the terminology of that claim 
you're going to put words, so you're going to put a definition to it. Is with the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Where are you going to use that? Well, you're going to use that on a contract. And who wrote that contract is the assignment that you then use the word by the author, by the claimant, by the boss of lead. Now, the term boss of lead was established by us 14 years ago. We are not defendants. We are not respondents. Re means no, spawn means to talk, and A and T, ANCE, A and C E means contract, no spoken contract. So when anybody in the court system of fiction addresses you as a respondent, they're, they're, not, they're not communicating with you. They're telling you to shut up and just take it. If they call you a defendant, D E means no, and A and T is contract. So they're saying make no contracts before this court because everything you did to get here was in violation of a, a fictitious law. And you haven't corrected that fictitious law or identified that fictitious law and you've participated with it, so now you are a defendant. We use the terminology vassali. What is a vassali? A vassal is a servant and an EE is an employee because we have value on here of $1. When you become a servant of a document, it has articulated an assignment of authority about what you did by the first-hand knowledge of who I am or who the author is of the document. And because of the value, it makes you an employee of this document. So when it is served upon you in the correct parse syntax grammar, you become a, a bonded individual. You have a duty. To, re, to correspond with this document. You do not respond. In the world of fiction, they ask you to respond. Re means no, spawn means to talk. Correspond comes from cooperation, corporation, communications. Words that start with CO mean to bring together a county, a court, a community. And you can look, go to a dictionary and pull up words. This is how you start to learn about parses and how certain words have value to start word sentences out or is this to, to begin the syllables of words. The individual who comes to us needs to have about 200 hours of training before your brain can actually comprehend moving from a world of fiction since you were one years old all the way up to 30, 40, 50 years of nothing but adverb, verb fictions. Your school teachers in schools, universities, colleges, and it didn't matter what country you came from or what language you speak, every single teacher on this planet for 8,500 years has been, inst has been instructed. Now, there's a unique word. In means no, instruct means to build, or con it means no construction. So they've been instructed to teach you adverb verb. So you can be harvested. You'll work very hard as a slave, accumulate your values, and then somebody will file a, file a lawsuit against you, and you'll walk right into a court. Now, all courts on planet Earth are foreign vessels in dry dock. We live here in Hawaii, but when we walk into a courthouse, we have left Hawaii, and we go into a foreign vessel that only uses fiction, adjective, Pronouns. They're going to make your name into an adjective pronoun. And they'll ask you four words. What is your name? Adverb, verb, adverb, verb. They're calling you a, a verb in this case. And if you answer, and you go ahead, you're traversing with the condition of a fiction. You're identifying yourself to be a fiction. And what they'll also do is they'll take a document and they'll capitalize your name on it in all uppercase speak, all uppercase spelling. Now, uppercase spelling means you are a nom de guerre dead person. Unique thing is, go to any cemetery on planet Earth and everybody's name on the, on the tombstone is written in uppercase. It means you're dead. If you're a dead person, under international maritime law, you cannot own property or write contracts. Well, if you can't write contracts, you can't own anything. So I guess you're just a, a servant. You're, you're, serv you're a servant 
or in slavery to somebody else that is very clever. But because the teachers didn't teach you how to read and write in school, and we have certified the fact that just about everyone on this planet has a second grade reading level. What's the difference between the phrase, see the ball in your first grade reader, see is a pronoun, does an adverb making ball a verb. As you know, ball is not a verb, it's a condition of state. It's supposed to be used as a fact. For the sight of the ball is what it should read. But it says, see the ball, and you accept that, because you're only one years old and you don't know any better. And then you see the word state of Hawaii, state of California, state of Nevada. It doesn't matter which state it is you're looking at. State is a pronoun, of is an adverb, modifying the verb of your state. How does the state verb sue somebody? Or to say, the people of Wisconsin. Does an adverb making people a verb, of is an adverb making Wisconsin a verb. I come from Wisconsin, that's where I was born. So the individual was brainwashed. Do you know that English teachers, everywhere we've gone, all over the United States and in foreign countries, or I'll rephrase that, grammar teachers. Yes. When they are presented with a correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, they get very scared, they walk away. If the student produces the correct parse syntax grammar in front of them, they suspend them from school, send them home. Don't allow them to interface with the other students because they would contaminate the world of fiction. Because the fiction has to protect the lies that have been told for the past 8,500 years. Or more. Or more. We went ahead and uh, I used to go to Australia, and I used to go to Canada. And I went to Canada, and I did some syntaxing on the Canadian grammar, and Queen Elizabeth ordered my visa pulled. So I syntaxed the Magna Carta for the British Crown. It was sold at Christie's of London two weeks later, showing that it was written in adverb verb in 1215 as a historical document with no value. But the Magna Carta was the cornerstone of the English Empire. It was a cornerstone of all the courts worldwide and the Bar Association. And now it's just a historical document of fiction, adverb, verb. Then they went ahead and they took away my ability to go to New Zealand and Australia because I was teaching the correct parse syntax grammar in Maori language as well as in the origine language. So they didn't want anybody uh, learning how to become correct in those locations. So they kicked me out of the country, took away my, my ability and my visa. So I then syntaxed the United Kingdom's constitution. I syntaxed the Irish constitution and the Irish government said, well, now that we know that it's fraud, would you write us a new one? Twelve hours later, I supplied them with a new constitution. Their parliament voted on it. And two days later, in August of 2012, they were awarded their independence after 660 years. Queen Elizabeth was on BBC two days later, and I witnessed it myself, saying that all the United Kingdom constitutions were null and void. The Zulus of South Africa listened to a radio show I had done, 150,000 of them, and asked me to write a new constitution for South Africa and recover the Zulu lands of South Africa because those were stolen through false and misleading information. On August 29, 2010, in Auckland, New Zealand, I made a statement that there has never been the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, laws, rules, regulations, or codes for the Universal Postal Union, Bern, Switzerland, under a new world order. United States Postal Service, which had had since 19, uh, from the year 2000, 2000, yeah, 2000, 2000, a correct parse syntax international bank treaty written by Russell and I, 115 pages long with all the certifications and overtones, then became, was called up, burned Switzerland and said, we'd like to see all the numbered accounts, 47,000 numbered accounts in Bern, Switzerland because you have a fictitiously conveyed contract to keep money of the United States citizens. 
47,000 numbered accounts were turned over to the United States Treasury, along with $4 trillion in assets. And the United States of America, because they had a correct, the post office, had a correct international treaty, now became the new, the new Universal Postal Union here in Washington, D.C. And as a result of that, they asked the 47,000 people that had numbered accounts in Switzerland, would you like to come get your money? Just explain to us how it got offshore and how you made it. Nobody showed up. So they got to keep the money under maritime law of salvage after one year and put $4 trillion into the United States Treasury. The power of words, the power of the parse syntax grammar, it's very important. And when we go to court, when we walk into a state court, a city court, a county court, a municipal court, a district court, a federal court, court of appeals, United States Supreme Court, doesn't matter what court system we walk into in this country. When you present the correct sentence structure, communication, parse syntax grammar, you get a document like this from Judge Mulloway here in the Hawaiian Islands. Suspending my ability to file grievances in the court. And this is a suspension written in adverb, verb, and we syntaxed it. I then prosecuted to the Department of Justice and President of the United States a quo warranto complaint for false and misleading statements, fictitious conveyance of grammar, deprivation of rights under coloring of law. I bonded it together, and I sent it to President Obama, who appointed Judge Mulloway to be a federal, to be a district judge here in the Hawaiian Islands. Shortly after he received this, a special federal judge was assigned to deal with me specifically as a federal postal judge in the Hawaiian Islands. That federal judge does not sit on a bench He's just there for one reason, to keep an eye on me as a federal postal judge in the Hawaiian Islands. Now, a unique thing going back here with the Hawaiians is that the 22nd of October, 1871, we're we'll giving you a little history of the Hawaiian Islands. King Kamehameha V goes ahead and signs a bankruptcy trust with England, with Bern, Switzerland, Universal Postal Union. And they go ahead and they transport all the gold, silver, platinum off the, off the Hawaiian Islands and give, it, give the Hawaiian Islands paper money. King Kamehameha V, he receives a lot of paper money to go out and buy the things he wants. King Kamehameha V is also a mason who takes his orders. When you become a mason, you have to give up your kingship or your queenship, and you have to swear allegiance to the Eastern Star, Senior Mason, or the in, the, in the, in the Masonic Lodge, you have to give up your king or your kingship to the Masons. And the Masons now run the country. Now the Senior Mason out here was the Postmaster General. So the Postmaster General in 1871 then became, he was the puppet master of King Kamehameha V. Now they had to wait one year under Maritime Law of Salvage, Title 46, Chapter 781, until the 22nd of October, 1872. And then there was a 45-day trust law that went into effect. Well, once the 45-day trust law expired, it was December 6, 1872, and King Kamehameha V was assassinated by poison, killing the last reigning monarchy of the Hawaiian Islands. Now because he had 1.8 million acres of land under his name. This had to go into the, what was now known to be the, the Bishop's Trust. And the trust now, they were holding the land in trust as there was no titles because the last reigning monarch had died. So the Masons, I went into uh, the Iolani Palace Archive Center along with a man named Hightower who's a friend of mine and a full-blooded Hawaiian out here, to research anything that happened between 1869 and 1875. The director of the uh, Archive Center said, there are no records from 1869 to 1875. We had a fire and they were all destroyed. I'm going, well, 
there's always multiple records. There's treaties with other countries. Well, then you have to go to all those other countries to get copies of the record, but we don't have any here. She says, there's, a ca there's the, the catalog of all the documents in the building. So we went over to the catalog, and we looked at 1872, 1873, and we found only one 3x5 card. On that 3x5 card, there was a, a, VIN, uh, a number, a microfiche number, which then took us to a microfiche film. We pulled up the Hawaii, uh, the Honolulu Star newspaper. And because Hightower wanted to look at what the correct, if they were using the Hawaiian flag in its correct dimensions. We were just looking for a flag, that was all. But on the bottom of the document, on the bottom of this one page document was the obituary with the Masonic eye and the Masonic uh, angle. So because it was in masonry, and I'm a mason, I looked at that document and I said, well, they're ordering the Portuguese, the French, the German, and the English to Honolulu, Hawaii to lodge number one. Now this is a January 8, 1893 document. So eight, January 8th, it takes three days for the steamer to go out to Kona and Hilo and three days to come back. That brings us up to January 14th. All the Masons meet at Lodge Number One. Lodge Number One is also the central post office for the Hawaiian Islands. Also, the, the Supreme Court of the Hawaiian Islands. Also, the Immigrations and Customs Building for the Hawaiian Islands. So now we have all five branches of government neatly packed into the Masonic Lodge. And all the Masons get together and they, cut a, they write a contract to take over the Hawaiian Islands. But the contract does not become legal for three days under the Rescissions Act, which is better known as the Lemon Law. So they had to wait three days and it went into effect on January 17, 1872. But now there's a death moratorium established in 1848 for 20 years. So to make sure, because the king is now dead, King Kamehameha is dead, they got to wait 20 years. On January 17, 1893, the military troops leave the ship and they surround the Iolani Palace. And Queen Iolani, who is an eastern star, takes orders from the postmaster general across the street and surrenders the island. Excuse was to avoid bloodshed. Point is, she wasn't a queen. She was merely an eastern star in disguise and surrendered to Hawaiian Islands. Everybody said, that's illegal. You can't take over our island. So the people went ahead and they protested. They went into the city courts, the state courts, the district courts. But who took over the island? It was the post office who controls the military. They were supposed to go into the Federal Postal Court, but the Federal Postal Court was closed in 1775, and it hadn't been reopened yet. The Federal Postal Court is where the blood Hawaiian people have to go to make grievances for the invasion. However, the Hawaiian nation, the Hawaiian government, is in bankruptcy October 22, 1871. So how does the bankrupt corporation called the United States of America, 1860, invade a bankrupt corporation called the Hawaiian Islands. Bankrupt corporations are not allowed to interfere with other bankrupt corporations. So this is totally illegal under international law. Their excuse was, we have to secure the coal, C-O-A-L. Coal is fuel for steam-powered warships. Whoever controls the steam-powered warship controls the entire Pacific Rim. The United States Western states had to be protected by a military, by a Navy. And the Navy sailing between California, Oregon and Washington, and uh, the Hawaiian Islands is about 2,800 miles. The next stop is 5,000 miles away, Tonga Tonga. And it's too far for a steamer to, 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 to travel. So everyone in the Pacific Ocean going from east to west had to stop in Hawaii to get coal fuel. And that's what this was all about. 
controlling the coal, controlling the fuel, the energy across the, across the world. When oil came in, people could run the entire distance. Nuclear power came in, they could dri drive, ships could go around the world now with no problem. So and the Hawaiian Islands now became irrelevant. Well, if you take the 22nd of October, 1871, being an individual that knows the timelines of how maritime works, and we add 70 years to that, we come up to October 22nd, 1941, plus 45-day trust law, gives us December 7th, 1941, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Except the Japanese bombed the Pearl Harbor 45 minutes before the bankruptcy was up, violating international bankruptcy laws which then uh, Roosevelt could declare an act of war, could throw the United States out of its isolation and get the people to sue to go to war to stop the Nazis and stop the invasion of the, the Philippines with the Japanese. So they allowed a, an atrocity to take place so that the people would become enraged. But the Japanese, when they bombed Pearl Harbor, did not bomb civilian targets, did not bomb Hawaii. They only bombed the post office. This was a war between one post office of Tokyo and the post office postmaster of the sovereign Hawaiian islands. Even though we had our Navy here, all Navy ships were under the post office. All Navy planes were under the post office. So it was a war between post offices worldwide not between the people of Hawaii. Scaring the people of Hawaii, they renewed their 70-year international bankruptcy with Rothschild. That expired 70 years later. The bankruptcy expired on December 7, 2011. But under maritime law of salvage, they had to wait one year to December 7, 2012. No law becomes legal in federal government for 90 days. That brings us up to the 5th of March, 2013. And then there's a three-day rescission law, which takes effect on March 8th, Friday. 20,000 Hawaiian people, were let, the sovereigns, were let go from the military bases because the post office controls the military and the sovereignty of Hawaii was now assured and the so Hawaiian islands are now a sovereign base island group. There is no offshore banking in the Hawaiian islands. Now, on the 6th of January, 2008, 22 members of the Kapuna Council signed a quantumized constitution for the Hawaiian Islands. We took it to The Hague, it was approved three days later. And on the 9th of January, 2008, all offshore banking left the Hawaiian Islands because the post office was no longer authorized to do any banking from any country only the sovereignty of the Bank of Hawaii and the Hawaii Bank. Pacific Rim Bank, I think, is here, and there's a Pacific Savings and Loans here. But there is no offshore banking with any country. Now, that shows that the post office controls the money, post office controls the banking, and that the Hawaiian Islands is a sovereign group of individuals. Now, the government is first becoming aware of this. This has all been published up on my website. And there's been more and more activity here on the island. A unique thing took place on January, uh, on March 8th, 2013. The 1888 post office, which was the federal postal court here in, on Maui, was raised in 72 hours without approval from any government agency. A $1.6 million building. Somebody was very afraid and authorized the demolition of the federal post office and the federal postal court on this island. And I live here on this island. So therefore, I was going to use that building as our federal postal court. And they didn't want that happening. Because then the world of fiction courts could be prosecuted. In 2002, I prosecuted 22 state and district judges here in the Hawaiian Islands. Twelve attorneys and two clerks. Russell, back in 2002, was my bailiff on this. Postmaster General. 
uh, by Bailiff, who's also my postmaster. And those were upheld by the United States Supreme Court and the World Court at The Hague. And now, most of those attorneys became judges. Some of the judges became Supreme Court judges. Some of the Supreme Court judges left and became Office of Hawaiian Affairs officers. The warrants are still open. All I need is the President of the United States to endorse them. So that's where we sit on that subject. The point is that 33 of the 92 judges on this island now have warrants for them because they used false and misleading statements, fictitious conveyance of grammar, and deprivation of rights under coloring of the law. Now, in California and in Washington, state of Washington, in 2008, I took the Washington Mutual. A friend of mine came from Washington, that had a mortgage with Washington Mutual, and says they're foreclosing my home. I looked at the contract. That's the one I just showed you here. And I syntaxed it. I identified all the words on the document, 4,700 words. And they were all fraudulently conveyed. When that document was given to Washington Mutual to stop the foreclosure, on Friday, they filed bankruptcy and their stock went from $60 a share to 10 cents on Monday because they had lied to 2 million people. The other banks rushed in to pick up these 2 million properties. Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo, Citibank, JP Morgan, and guess what happened? Their stock dropped about 90% as well because they had just picked up fraudulent conveyance of language. And when all the awareness took place on the 6th of November, 2010, Lloyds of London got a copy of the mortgage contracts and canceled all 64 million mortgage contract title insurance policies in the United States for false and misleading statements. And when we every time we go into the federal district court, are we going to the, the state courts? The judges say, I can't understand the correct parse syntax grammar. I don't know what this means. I can't see a fact. And they, they want to dis vacate the cases. They only allow a case that is voided, a case that use, misuses grammar, because then they can harvest this individual coming into their court, because they are a foreign vessel and dry dock. Under federal rules of civil procedure 44.1, all human beings are foreign to the court. All grammar that they speak is foreign to the court. All documents that they file are foreign to the court. They want you to take an attorney. How do you spell attorney? A-T-T, -T. like an illusion, I-L-L, -L. like an imagination, I-M-M, -M. like art, A-R-T. And they want you to use a vowel and two consonant words. They want you to use negative words. You can never prove the negative condition of a state. Our federal court only deals with the correct parse syntax grammar, only deals with the mathematics of how things are written. So don't bring a case to us, an adverb verb, because we will not hear it. We will teach you how to be correct. And by learning how to become correct in your grammar, you can put the correct mathematical words, the actual meaning of those words on paper so that we can understand what is being said so that the fact for the fact is for the fact. Now I'm going to turn this over to Russell D. J. Gould here right now and I'll let him explain postage and uh, and banking. Now let's get a little bit into the technicalities of David was holding up the uh, fee for freight. Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, the fee for freight is consideration that is paid to move the vessel from point A to point B. Right? And so there's a value of postage. When we place our autograph across the, across the postage, it makes us a postmaster letter carrier 
for the freight forwarding and allowing who we want to come in contract with that vessel. If somebody, we have a treaty with another nation or another citizen or a contract with another citizen and the citizen is in now time and space grammar and he's using quantum communication skills to post his roads. One of the things that we have to look at is to get his ship's papers in order. His ship's papers are the paperwork that gives specifics of your nationality, specifics of who you are as a being on this planet. It has description of height, weight, a lot of the forensics that we need as we engage with the public safety officers in the field or out on the streets. Because of that criteria, we have what's called claims of the life. Claims of the life are, an art, are a grammar articulation of who you are. When we place the postage on the contract and we take it into the foreign vessel in dry dock, before we get into kind of the functions of that, I want to give you an overview of what we have set up so you can understand why your vessel is sitting on our post road, because that's very important. As David was explaining earlier and giving closure, the United States was involved in many bankruptcies. And as the bankruptcies tranched or, or rolled over and rolled over, uh, they came to a very exciting time in our life back in 1999, back in 2000. And uh, David and I were studying the bankruptcy laws and, and looking at the contracts and putting this, this program together. And we realized that they were going to have to vacate the trusteeship under Title 39, Section 101, Subsection B. They were going to have to vacate the presidency of the United States because he was the elected trustee of the bankruptcy. So thus, they had to kick in the 2000 election and vacate the time frame. David and my, myself particularly seeing it, I immediately uh, got in front of that 93 days because nothing becomes law for 90 days, three-day rescission. And so I was in front of it while they physically left the land of contract, the District of, or the District of Columbia, which is a pronoun and adverb verb, they physically had to leave the contracting rights of the trusteeship and vacate the Constitution of the United States, which is a bankruptcy document, which David had discussed earlier. So during that time frame, I filed in a contract as a postal hyphen inspector, and the U.S. Post Office, since they didn't have a postal Postmaster General at the time, David and I spent uh, three hours on the phone with uh, the Postmaster General of the United States, the gentleman at the time, his name was William Henderson. After we explained to him the rules of his job, he retired within 72 hours because he realized he didn't have authorization. But my contract was sitting in his office. So instead of refusing the contract, they flipped it over placed a label on the contract, on, the, on the, what's called a NALEM. The NALEM is a passenger aboard a vessel, and put postmaster hyphen general and mailed it back to me. Of course, I autographed across the label because labels are postage stamps, and it made me the postmaster general to, give, to allow freight to come aboard our, our, our post roads, where we were taking our courts, where we were taking our contracts, where we were going with our banking, and we took it to the mechanics on a global level and gave it to the world through the Universal Postal Union in Bern, Switzerland, which David and myself went to on June 18th of 2003 and sat down with those gentlemen in Bern, Switzerland. It was a very fun day for us because we, <laughs> we, we realized who was in charge, how the grammar was working, and we were really at peace with ourselves because we realized the world could have a chance to join with that for certifications through their clearing houses from nation to nation, country to country. So it was a very, very pleasant time. Felt it was very gratifying to see the, the type of knowledge that was being explained that day at the table when David and I were there, and the, how re reciprocating back it was. It was there was no animosity. It was they were a little confused because we had beat them to the punch, and so because we what that meant is we we, we filed it, and they didn't know what was happening. And because they lack knowledge, we, when they vacated the trusteeship in the 2000 presidential election with the Florida Chads, uh, everybody kind of remembers that. It's, you know, the, oh, no, we got a Chad problem. Nah, that's not what's happening. You, you got to vacate for so many days. And so David and myself put ourselves in position to function as a post road in a clearinghouse, uh, which deal, deals with the laws of, of the bailments, which is dealing with moving contract from point A to point B, dealing with the freight. 
There are phraseologies such as a word called transshipment. Transshipment is moving the cargo words off the paper and making them uh, factual for, for the duties now. So it, 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 we created freight hyphen waybills, which is uh, basically closure of the, what's on the manifest or on, on the goods. Uh, we, we had uh, transit waybills for transportation, and as we would go to Switzerland or the post office in D.C., it would then became a switching waybill, which we stayed in control because we autographed the stamps. And we, we maintained the rules of the continuance of the evidence, which now gave us control of our, of our capability to come into this building today and say mechanically we comprehend the laws of the bailments to have a, a claimant who has been damaged to come to our court and say David and I with certified knowledge corporate comprehend the mechanics of why we're sitting here. And we've taken it to such levels as giving closures through the uh, Global Bureau of the Weights and Measures and David and I have also disqualified the International Maritime Organization out of the United Kingdom, out of London, uh, London England. And uh, their contracts were all f fraudulent, and it deals with uh, coming in and out of foreign vessels and dry docks, dealing with wharfs and, and, and docking procedures and harbor masters. And there's a lot of mechanics that, that we have put into place uh, dealing with uh, our contracts as fee for freight as our mooring lines. M-O-O-R-I-N-G. So now we have established, in those mooring lines, we established fundamental contract timelines. These are the contract timelines that David was explaining in the bankruptcies, but then we applied them to how we were moving our contracts and our claims, such as our sovereign positions at the United Nations, which David and I sat down specifically with the uh, chief postal administrator, Robert Gray, at 1 UN Plaza in April of 2003. He confessed to me, and David was there, that he did, the United Nations does not have jurisdiction of post roads. They do not have jurisdictions of militaries because I had filed for uh, commander-in-chief of NATO and the different military organizations around the world because I, I did not want the citizens to be harmed by this martial law. And I realized that the, the value of grammar and the function of not going to war over math problems, which is the duties for breaking the bills of the lading, the breaking bulk of the words for the, for the compliance of the contract was, was at a very um, humble realm to be in. And so we had to make sure that it, it didn't get used for bad. And so that's why we, we've presented our, our situation uh, to the Pentagon uh, to, and to NATO and to, you know, uh, the Russians and to different, I can't really get into all the specifics of it. Uh, the citizens can feel at peace that when they join our, our situation, that mo no martial law entity is going to thwart their, their, their community, the security within their community. We have taken the necessary steps to educate those at the top end so that when citizens come in or nations come in to join with us, that we control the shipping lanes through uh, correct communication, parse, syntax, grammar, through the laws of the bailments and the, and, and the, and the, the functions that occur there in, in the dynamics of, of global, the bank, global banking construct. Uh, we have articulated and give, given to the world our banking charters. Our banking charters we can write in and out of every language in the world and we lose no deviation in our sentence structures. Granted, some communications do not use prepositional phrases. So in those specific instances, we use the prepositional phrase of that country's or nation's grammar style to, and we write it in their grammar and then we correlate it to whatever nation's doing business with that, with that specific <clears throat> country. Right. What that meant is that <clears throat> if a country does not have or does not use prepositional phrases in their language to maintain the mathematical interface, we go ahead and we keep the English prepositional phrases intact, but we trans transmit the word, just like we'll say, uh, uh, for the water in the glass. Now, they don't have for the or in the. They'll just say water glass or glass, glass water. Well, they'll call it a water glass. And we'll go ahead and leave the English prepositional phrase in there, but we, we will use their terminology or their words to both identify the word water and the word glass, because all 5,000 languages on this planet have a word for water. 
because it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental. So is glass is a fundamental. So where fundamentals are in place, this way the mathematical interface can always be guaranteed to be mathematically correct when we're translating between one communication source and another communication source. Go ahead. Okay. So back to the post roads. Once we realized uh, the dynamics of what we had created, David and I realized that it was fundamentally sound to give it to the world. And we spent months and months at the United Nations meeting with the, your, the ambassadors of your specific countries, if you had an ambassadorship there. Uh, we met with the Postal Administration as, as well as a lot of uh, people that were uh, uneducated in uh, correct communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Um, we then presented the, uh, the contracts, of course, to the World Banking System, uh, the IMF, the World Bank. We've alerted all stock markets in the world. We have a, a function, a clearinghouse, to create up our own title system, our own wealth systems. Uh, we have our own global monetary system up and functioning, and it's a global monetary system. We have five stock markets around the world that we can take our clearinghouses and safeguard people's values. We do not trespass with fiction. What that means is, like David was explaining with the lawsuits, we don't allow fiction grammar into our banking system. All banking contracts and quantum banking have to have my certification on it on this planet, as well as David's witnessing. We work as a team corporate, and there's not going to be any division there. So those that try to divide, it will be a, it's, it, well, number one, you don't have authorization. And number two, it's, it's, I'm a young man, 40 years old. I have different functions in banking on this planet, different platforms, different styles. Because of the different banking contracts that we, I have been privy to uh, through certain situations, uh, the bankers that are doing things are doing it wrong. You're quite frankly uneducated in the movement of monies on this planet. Please get a hold of us to safeguard your peoples, safeguard the equity construct of your peoples, the peoples of your nations. Please get a hold of us for the, the, um, the, the, the taxing, the, the, which is all false and mis under false and misleading statements. We have a consumption tax. We must do away with this glorified babysitter system that is creeping upon all of us at a tremendous level. The glorified baby system are, is the adverb verb world who tries to force their lie upon you and say that if you don't believe in our lie, then, then you can't sit in our, in, our, in our babysitting jails. And so we don't need babysitters as citizens of the world. We need to become accountable for what we do. And being accountable for what we do allows the, prep, the preposition, we preposition the facts so we can only look at the condition of the mind, the condition of the heart, on what was being articulated for the performance of the contract. Uh, as far as freight way bills and, and all the mechanics there, do you need me to go through all that? Or what do you want me to do as far as that goes for our court? Well, you can go ahead and <clears throat> educate the world. I mean, this video is going to go up on the Internet. Okay. And the world is going to see it. The world is going to translate it. Okay. Uh, well, so we'll give them as much information as we have time for. Okay, okay. Well, as David was explaining earlier, uh, David and I spent time rewriting the postal laws, which the United States Postal Service used our authorization to come in and harvest the citizens around the world in Switzerland because Switzerland was using false and misleading statements. They were an adjective, adjective pronoun. Their mechanics for, uh, for the uh, freight way bills and, 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 and the fundamentals that occur for registering corporations for posting their roads were all done under false, false and misleading pretenses and they did not give the countries that were coming in communication with them, they did not give them uh, three-day rescission that they were going to be using false and misleading statements. Thus, the United States Post Office used our technology and in compliance with Title 18, Section 1699, had proof of service for the transportation of the cargoes. I specifically wrote that treaty for them in October 4th of 2002. Uh, David and I were on the contract together. It was a corporate movement. I spent uh, a year and a half on those contracts, uh, just making sure that the guidelines for the movement and the transshipment of cargoes, postage, vessels, contracts, had a construct to where we could articulate values, articulate grammar, and make sure that there was accountability and honor amongst countries and amongst postal systems. Uh, the U.S. Post Office, every time that David and I go to meet with them, they are very afraid. Uh, we just caught the United States Postal Service 
vacating their trusteeship for chairman of the Board of Governors for the Federal Postal Service. I, of course, claimed the position, caught him in a three-day lemon law, and the rest is history right now. We're on a 45-day moratorium on that, so we're good to talk about that. So that was kind of exciting. Another thing that occurred is uh, when you're moving values, posting your roads, everybody has a birth certificate when you get birthed, typically in the, in the fiction world, in your hospitals. That birth certificate, the postmaster doctor, bank banker, puts his certified seal on it saying he delivered you at such and such a time, such and such a date. At that point, the, the fee for putting the embossment seal on that contract, your birth certificate, which is a pronoun adverb verb, the seal itself uh, gets paid for through bills of the lettings, through your Federal Reserve which is, has two signatures on it for certification, which is proof of service for usury. The post office itself authorizes the bills of the ladings. One small problem. They vacated the trusteeship under Title 39, uh, Section 101, Subsection B, and they did not have a constitution when they vacated in the 2000 election. This is where my post roads came in to be valid and they're correct and they were passed on in what was called a sizen of the law, sizen of the fact, sizen of the legality, which gives me a position to speak as a position of the authority when it deals with postage on what I'm giving you guys closure on today. Um, because we did our timelines right, because I was the only person under contract uh, during the time of the, of the 2000 election, I then, uh, we, we had a, a scenario that occurred years later where David and I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the U.S. Supreme Court and they had taken a gold filing from me, which means I paid my filing fee with a gold troy ounce. They took gold as a, as a consideration for fee for freight, which changes the dynamics of equity tremendously. Uh, the bailments there shifted and I shifted into gear. We hit our timelines correct. Uh, we went and registered our fee for freight for bonds. Uh, we went, showed up at the Pentagon as joint muster masters. Uh, they directed us to the United States International Trade Commission. David and I spent many days down there talking to those gentlemen who, they know who we are, we're gonna, not gonna share names, but they, they were convinced that America was a verb at, at the end of it. They were, they, were, they were quite humorous about it, very friendly, they were concerned because they were basically out of a job, but you know we, we kept the illusion going at that time. Uh, they then directed us through Homeland Security. Uh, in um, August of 2004, David and I met with Homeland Security. Um, they told us flat out that we do not have authorization to function as a corporation, but the people are really foolish and they believe us. However, the three directors that came out to meet with us from Homeland Security wouldn't meet us in the building. We had to go all the way out to the sidewalk because they said we couldn't, because we were sovereigns, we couldn't be in, the in their building. The <laughs> same thing happened when we walked into the FBI building. We were in there for an hour and 15 minutes with 12 directors sitting behind a glass, one of those mirrored glass windows, doing that, watching a one hour and 15 minute interview when they realized I was the federal judge that prosecutes judges from Hawaii and I immediately had to be removed from the building because I was a sovereign and couldn't be in the building. Plan of fiction. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the, back to the, the posting of the roads, which is this is a very safe umbrella that uh, worldwide uh, the citizens of our world can join under uh, because your countries and your nations are in joinder uh, through false and misleading statements through the Universal Postal Union, which is what happens when you go get your corporation case numbers in Australia, in, Auck in Auckland, New Zealand, and in the places that we do have our citizens that are studying in Canada. Um, the, the function that occurs when you register it there goes through, they go through a dynamic of bookkeeping, of auditing, of clearing, of freight, you know, there's, there, there's a function that occurs. Uh, within that function of bookkeeping, uh, what they create what's called ship's papers, which have registrations on them. Vessels have names, vessels has, have numbers, they have times, they have dates, they have fee for freight, and it all gets registered in a roundabout way through the Universal Postal Union, who, of course, gets rid of those because they don't, they don't, they collect the tax, they don't pay the tax. So they, they, they but there's a, there's a mechanic that occurs there, and in that mechanic, 
as you register your claims in the, in the different ver locations around the world, you'll find that uh, being on our post road and being in quantum grammar, once you comprehend the mechanics of the bailments of it, you will find a lot of security in your equity. And so you can use the, the, the grammar not only in lawsuits, but you can apply it in your day-to-day -day function as you interact with your community as you interact with your local governments, as you interact with your local governors, and as the pecking order goes up, because you are all working for the same post office. Whether you know it or not, you all have birth certificates, you have bills of the ladings, you have driver's licenses, you have passports. When you go to the military, you don't work for the Marines, I'm sorry. You go register first and get your number from the post office. Then you run into the Marines. So, you, so you're, there's a function there. That's why the post office controls the military. And that's how the pecking order works in the real world. And the ball on top of the flag at the post office is for recruiting and advertising for recruiting. Correct. So anytime you see that, you're, a ball on top of the, the flag, it means you're walking into a recruiting center. If you have an eagle on top of the flag, that's supposed to be for the President of the United States. But just like on the dollar bill, if the wings are up, you're in a postal court. If the wings are down, it's a phoenix, and you're in a Vatican banking court. Pay attention to your flag because anything you put on top of the flag nice. has jurisdiction over the contract of the flag itself. If you have a spear on top of the flag, that means you're in a military court martial. And if you're not in the military, it's the wrong venue, wrong jurisdiction. And the word jurisdiction means opinion if you look it up. Thank yeah. you. Anyway, back to the, the ensigns on the flag standards. One of the things that David and I witnessed is as we walked into the United Nations, as we walked into the various diplomatic embassies, we were functioning at a level of consular post. David and I had rewritten, spent time rewriting the Vienna Convention on the functions of missions for diplomatic diplomacy as we, as we realized that the world would want to come and look for correctness. So we, we, we set up a function for consular missions, consular employees, uh, more of a what, what the fiction would call State Department, which is an adjective pronoun. And we filed our uh, letters of the rogatory with those venues to give them closure that we have evidence and testimony to be brought forth as whistleblowers. Um, when, we, when we walked into these embassies, we realized that they were flying three by five boat flags outside with the ball on top. So David and I were like, heck, they're recruiting. So we walk on in there thinking, wow, we're following flag etiquette, following all the rules. You walk in the door, and they all had spires on the top, which meant they were at war with their people. So it was like, wait a minute, this is false and misleading. You're out here in one venue advertising this. When we walk in the door, you're telling us that you're at war with us. And they also had yellow braids and yellow fringe on all 200 ambassador flags. All Correct. countries had the yellow fringe on them. Correct. So they were, uh, with the, the braid on the flag, it meant they were maritime vessels in dry dock. The flags outside said they were vessels in dry dock. And then they had another flag that had no fringe and nothing on it hanging in their offices. Correct. So they had eight different flags displayed as we went through each one of these embassies. Then when we asked the ambassadors what each flag meant, none of them had an idea except Japan. They knew all eight flags and what they meant. Yeah. They, they knew flag protocols and etiquette. So we wound up doing flag presentations for <laughs> almost a week to all these 82 different countries that signed treaties with us under banking because they wanted quantum grammar. Yeah, Ito was good in Japan. Yeah, I mean, he was it, really it was real on good. point. Yeah, he's on point. There are educated people out there. A lot of times when you walk onto a military base and you're dealing with flag duty officers, you know, they're on point too and you got to really know your, your goods when you walk through the door. I want to get into a little bit of the postal collections. And this is kind of relevant for those who are involved in our um, deeds of the trust, our quo warranto complaints, dealing with title issues of property. The umbrella that has been made for you is David and I have disqualified the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, which is an adjective, pronoun, adverb, verb, conjunction, verb, scenario. And the International Bureau of Weights and Measures was the location on how all nations would articulate the measurement of latitude, longitude, feet, inches, the description that we would use to survey on our lands. 
So it would have uh, uh, the, the ley lines you know, through Greenwich and all the, the manipulations and the wars behind that when the, someone would be conquered, they would go in, under that umbrella, be brought into you know, to your metric systems and, and, and brought into a universal umbrella of control through the post office. So David and I developed a corporation called the Global Hyphen Bureaus of the Weights and Measures. And the reason why I bring this up is uh, the claimants, which I comprehend are here today, uh, have an articulation of quiet hyphen title. Title itself is because there is no titles on the land, incorrect communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Um, the, uh, uh, the umbrella is there that we can safeguard your title within our umbrella, and you may not uh, comprehend the mechanics of why we can articulate and pay fee for freight and sign off on that, but uh, we can give you closure that an outside ruling of surveying would have no jurisdiction, which is JU outside of jurisdiction, outside of time and space, would have no jurisdiction on that title that we would allow into our, into our postal construct. The reason why I say postal construct is as you bring a complaint to us, you autograph the postage stamp. At that point, there are bailments and timelines that, that David and I trigger in our system that maybe most of you are unaware of. Uh, we, we just had a situation in Hawaii here where we were under contract with another person from a year ago and she did not give notice on three-day rescission of her year timeline on what she was going to do with the contract, therefore disqualifying her off, off the position of, of the platform, which is unfortunate, but knowledge is how it is. I just kind of wanted to bring that up because in case. Anyway. So uh, if, if you bring your quiet titles, you're in a construct uh, for, to articulate. We have taken jurisdiction of, with our sea treaties in the global hyphen bureaus of the weights and measures for the symbolism usury of the alphabet, the symbol usury of functions in mathematics, the symbol usury of numbers zero through nine, and how to create a conclusion of the sums and differences. So these are some of the mechanics that have been put in place over the last 19 years to bring us to your quiet titles here today. Right. You, uh... I mean, uh, we can get... I, hmm? I suggest that we do a conclusive statement right now and we'll take a break. Oh, no problem. Uh, if, if anyone has any questions about any nations out there, any citizens on uh, the mechanics of postal me mechanics and postal methods and where I learned, I'm getting, hey, where did you learn all this? You know, I learned right in the middle of the courtroom. Um, I went toe-to-toe -to -toe for a long, long time and took my, my beatings in the middle of the courtroom, uh, was used as a piece of cargo by, you know, hundreds of judges who, you know, really taught me well. And uh, those that hate me, eh? and those that, that, that taught Respect me, you. and they, they honor me, thank you. Because uh, I've, I've worked very hard, and, and that's where I learned. You know, people ask, where did you learn all this? Well, for me, it was, it's been a 19-year journey from sitting right in the middle of the courtroom, and I'm standing there by myself, because I have to stand on my own. And I'm totally confident doing that anywhere in the world. And uh, that's one thing I will I thank David is that David would always support me, but he would never go with me to, 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 so I would learn my own value and I would cherish it and I would honor it and I would be able to give it to you in a way that you wouldn't have to go through the same, the same circumstances and the tricks and traps that I went through uh, because I was my own worst enemy by not knowing. And so as I learned and the functions became more relevant, uh, the humility and some of the, the conditions, it, uh, that's where I learned my postal me mechanics. Okay, we're going to break for lunch.